I'd like to welcome you to this webinar, Better Together, Organizational Partnerships and Collaboration. My name is Andy King with the Corporation for National and Community Service. I'll be your host for today's session. Joining me are Bethany DeSoblin and Sam Graziani. They are producers and technical support for today's program. You'll see all of us in the Q&A in the chat, helping to answer your questions and provide you additional information and support during this session. It's now my pleasure to introduce our main speaker for today. Some of you may have already met Amy Salinas, as she's a facilitator at many of our VISTA pre-service orientations. Amy has spent the last 24 years working in the fields of national service, community development, and youth development. In the national service realm, Amy served first as an AmeriCorps member and then worked as a, uh, for an AmeriCorps program and then at the Texas State Commission where she monitored and supported Texas AmeriCorps programs. For the last 10 years, Amy has worked as a consultant supporting national service programs and nonprofit organizations. Recently, she started her own business, On3Learn, where she and her co-owners are developing web-based courses for the AmeriCorps field. Later on in the session, we'll be hearing from VISTA member Alex Bew, and he'll tell you more about his work in just a bit. As we get started, I want to thank you for responding to the chat question that we had posted before the session began. There was really a wealth of information that you all shared about what you're doing related to partnership development, some of it, uh, some of you rather. Uh, it looks like you are responsible for reaching out, uh, doing research, finding potential partners in the community. Others of you are supporting or maintaining uh, existing partnerships, and it seems like there's a really a wide variety of partnerships that you're working on. Some of them may be between nonprofits and schools. I saw some with uh, technology in schools or technology, bringing technology to nonprofit organizations and trying to bring different uh, elements or different sectors together to make that happen. Um, it was also interesting for me to see just how many of you are working within, say, a municipal government or a county government or, uh, or some other governmental organization or a school system because we often think of VISTA in nonprofit organizations, but of course we have VISTAs in lots of different types of organizations. Um, and it seems like many of you in the government uh, realm are really heavily involved in partnership development. So thank you for sharing all of that. And of course you can scroll back through the chat to see what some of your colleagues have been saying about their work related to partnership development. So on the screen, you can see what we are hoping that you'll get out of today's webinar. We hope that you'll be able to identify different types of partnerships that are out there and the associated level of investment and benefits that go with each. We also hope to clarify the conditions that signify readiness for partnerships or collaboration. And third, we want you to be able to identify steps that you can take and tools that you can use to help you begin your partnership work. In terms of our agenda, here's a quick snapshot of what you're going to cover today. Um, we'll start out by looking at the benefits of partnering and, and look at also a definition of what a partnership is and then uh, go through different types of partnerships that are possibilities. We'll hear an example of partnership development from one of our Promise Zone VISTA initiatives, and we'll take a look at the different stages of partnership development and identify uh, where our focus will be today. <clears throat> We've got some tips and ideas around what makes or breaks uh, partnerships so that you can have those ideas ready um, as you're launching into your partnership work. And uh, we'll finish the presentation with a look at uh, uh, Sorry, um, we'll look at some resources that will be useful for you as you get going in your partnership development work. And of course, we'll have plenty of time for your questions um, near the end of the presentation. So now, with that introduction, I'm going to turn things over to our main presenter, Amy Salinas. Thank you, Andy. It's really great to be here with um, such a large audience of VISTA members. I really love getting to meet some of you at pre-service orientation, and I'm really excited about sharing some insights around creating effective community partnerships. And I'd like to echo 
what Andy said earlier about the great responses we got from the beginning questions. There's really some amazing work that's going out there and such a diversity of projects, and it seems like also a diversity of, of levels of partnerships from thinking about getting it started to already in the midst of it, and then different levels that we'll also talk about shortly. So um, thank you for sharing. But before, before we begin to talk more about community partnerships, we would like to ask you just another question for a moment. So take a few minutes and would you mind sharing why you might engage in partnering with others to do the work you are tasked to do in communities? And just a reminder, enter your ideas in the chat box and make sure you send to all participants because we want to make sure that your comments can be read by everyone. So what does your VISTA project hope to gain by partnering with other organizations? And it looks like there's, a, again, a, a wide range of things. Um, uh, some of you are looking to do outreach to gain partners, perhaps, or supporters, or, or clients, or beneficiaries for your services. Um, someone commented that uh, individually we can't do it all, so in order to improve our efforts, um, we need to collaborate with others. Um, lots of things around uh, building capacity, which is great uh, as a focus for VISTAs to, to partner with other organizations to bring in additional resources, skills, talents, or other, um, other resources to, to build capacity. Um, reaching a broader audience, engaging new donors, um, develop more relevant programming. Um, bottom line, to be more effective. So you can see there's a lot of commonality, a lot of um, things that you're saying that uh, resonate with your colleagues. Um, so Amy, I'm going to turn it back to you with that quick snapshot of, of the responses. Great, thanks. I think they already addressed the next slide with their responses, but we'll echo some again of what you all contributed. Um, talking a little bit briefly about the benefits of partnerships, the answer really is relatively simple. There's an added value in working with other organizations. But additionally, there are a few major benefits that we can briefly discuss. Actually, I think all of which you all responded to in, in your responses to the previous question, but let's just briefly highlight them again. One, partnerships attract joint funding. Um, many, as you all um, responded in your, your chat, and your answers to the question, many funders are now requiring collaboration in order to receive funding, so partnerships can help you get more dollars. It also reduces the amount of competition and, and fragmentation of services, so as resources diminish, organizations can and need to work together to share resources and support one another in areas where limited, which you also shared in your responses. Partnerships can also help organizations be more efficient and effective in the work you're doing by reducing duplication and overlap. Again, you also shared that in your responses. Additionally, it extends the organization's reach by supporting more people. There is also increased credibility within communities and with other entities that come along with partnering. Um, we mentioned funders before, but policymakers and just the community in general, I think, see greater credibility when you're, you're more likely to work with others. Partnerships also foster an, foster an environment of mutual learning and understanding um, of everyone's strengths, and assets, and limitations. And then, of course, it increases the impact we have on the complex challenges our communities face. Many of us are doing very similar work or we're targeting similar groups that, again, are facing very complex challenges. And if we're inclusive in our partnerships, particularly including people that we ultimately serve, we can ensure greater success by involving the people that are most affected by the problem. And finally, by working together, we can support a more cumulative approach to addressing poverty, and that's a concept we discussed at PSO, or pre-service orientation, when we looked at the various theories of change. Now, while the benefits of partnerships can be really great, it's important, however, to recognize that these benefits of effective partnerships do not appear overnight, as I'm sure a lot of you all can attest to. Establishing effective and inclusive partnerships takes time, and it is important to critically consider who your potential partners might be to create the right framework and foundation from the start and to review the structure and process of the partnership on an ongoing basis to measure its success or failure. And we're gonna spend some time talking about that. So we've talked so far about the benefits of partnering with others, and we've kind of used two words interchangeably, partnerships and collaboration. 
So before we go any further into this topic, let's talk about the term partnership. There are a lot of definitions out there about partnerships or collaborations, but this one in particular is one we're using for this session. So as we think about partnerships, they're typically referred to as inherently complex but mutually beneficial and well-defined relationships between two or more entities, the purpose of which is to achieve results that are more likely to achieve together than alone, helping the organizations better serve the community and reach its own mission-focused goals for which we just talked about. All the parties involved work towards shared objectives through a mutually agreed division of labor, with each having something to gain by working with one another. The relationship is typically long-term, it can be flexible and organic in its approach. So a lot of important concepts that we just talked about here, all of which we're going to touch on at some point in this webinar. So while the definition sums up, you know, in general what partnerships are, there are varied degrees of partnerships that can exist in community work, all of which you actually shared in your initial responses to that beginning question. And each of those different levels of partnership require different levels of investment and involvement. So let's talk a little bit about those varied levels. So like I just said, there are varied types or levels of partnership that exist, each of which requires varied levels of investment from the different parties involved and varied levels of involvement. So if you remember back at the pre-service orientation, we spent some time talking about varied levels of community involvement. And just like community involvement, there are varied levels of partnership that each have their distinct purpose, their distinct levels of commitment, they have their benefits and challenges, and they also have their appropriateness based upon the life cycle of the group and the community or the, you know, the goal of the particular project. There's no right or wrong about each of these partnership types. It's important to understand what each one is about, when they may be appropriate, and what are the benefits and limitations. So while we're not going to go into great detail about each, each level, we are going to briefly review them and provide some specific examples. So networking is the first level in partnership work, and this is one actually I saw a lot of you all talk about that you're currently doing um, as a part of your VISTA assignment. Um, it's the investment for networking is typically low, and the integration that's required of the varied stakeholders or parties involved is also low. Networking, you know, as you all know, involves getting people and groups together to learn more about one another and to exchange information, all of which is really important. Networking helps people and organizations learn more about one another, and it does require the least amount of time and limited trust, so that's why it's kind of the first stage of partnership work. Ultimately, it's used to help develop understanding and to support increased dialogue. So here's an example of a partnership at the networking level that's based in Sacramento, California. Founded in 2001 through a partnership with the Sacramento Municipal Utility District and United Way, they founded a, a networking group called the Network Cafe. It's an example of a partnership group that brings organizations closer together to improve community resources and services for people in need in Sacramento. So every month, over 50 representatives from local human service organizations meet for a complimentary lunch to share ideas and collaborate on issues and services that impact people in crisis. And thanks to the ongoing support from the two founding entities, um, Sacramento Food Bank and Family Services is able to provide an opportunity for organizations to exchange information in a relaxed environment with good food, meaningful interaction, and great networking. So what does Sacramento Food Bank and Family Services get out of this networking level partnership? What they get is access to dozens of other human service organizations. They get partners that are well informed about the commu current community needs and they have easy access to partners who can work together with them when they need to respond to emerging issues. Coordination is the second level in partnership work, where the investment of time and resources is a little bit higher, and the integration that is required of the various stakeholders or parties involved is also greater. At the coordination level, more formal arrangements and relationships are formed, putting things in writing to help parties understand their varied commitments. New structures or systems might be created to help provide a particular program or service so that duplication is eliminated. 
This requires that the parties involved create a shared mission, develop plans that require all parties to play a role and activities are either altered or created so that a common purpose can be addressed. And the end result of this level of partnership work is a reduction in service duplication. We're going to share a couple of examples for this level of partnership, the first of which is a coordination level based here in Austin, Texas, where I'm actually, where I reside. So in the late 1990s and early 2000, a small group of literacy service providers and concerned community leaders coordinated a series of community forums and they facilitated discussions centered on literacy needs in the community. And several themes emerged, including the need for both a centralized point of coordination for the community's literacy services as well as increased public awareness and resources for those programs. So in response, they founded the Literacy Coalition of Central Texas in 2001 and became professionalized with its first paid staff member in 2003. So by working with their network of partner programs, they implemented services to underserved communities, they expanded into new markets, they increased the awareness of literacy needs in Central Texas, and they effectively doubled the number of learners being served by literacy programs in the region. <laughs> Austin, Texas is representing, I see, good. So the example we're providing here, this next one, is actually an example of a partnership at the coordination level that involves two distinct organizations that are actually located hundreds of miles apart, illustrating that partners can come from anywhere, not just a geographical specific area. So in July of 2004, this is an example uh, of Seattle Children's Theater and the Children's Theater Company in Minneapolis. They, were, uh, they are considered to be the two leading theaters for young people in the nation. They created plays for young audiences to provide quality scripts written for young audiences to professional theaters, amateur community theaters, and schools. So these two distinct organizations worked together to create this particular initiative. And the third level of partnership work is collaboration. This, this level of partnership requires more investment of time and resources and, and integration, greater integration is also required at the various stakeholders or parties involved. So this level is, is kind of similar to the one before, but it requires a little bit more formality as separate organizations are typically brought into a new structure. So the relationship is more long-term focused with a specific mission that the parties are focusing on and an equal contribution of resources. This type of relationship collaboration helps to support greater sharing of resources and also extends the reach and scope of services by forming consortiums where the organiza organizations can identify themselves with a specific community or work purpose. So let's take a look at an example of a partnership at the collaboration level based in another Texas example, Tarrant County. As we talk about it, listen specifically for the investment of time and resources that is a little different from the ones before. So this example is the Tarrant County Homeless Coalition. It's a not-for-profit 501c3 organization that was formed in 1989. This particular coalition leads, coordinates, and develops strategies and resources to end homelessness. They, this coalition also plans, funds, and administers programs that assist homeless individuals and families in their transition from homelessness to housing. They are the lead agency in the HUD-funded Fort Worth, Arlington, and Tarrant County Continuum of Care for programs that provide shelter, housing, and services to homeless persons. And this particular coordination is called the Continuum of Care. So the Continuum of Care planning process creates a strategic system of care to provide homeless people with housing and services appropriate to their needs. <coughs> Um, TCHC, as I'm calling it, uh, the Homeless Coalition, they provide strategic functions for the community that include professional development for case managers and social workers. They work with their partners to set standards for best practices among homeless service providers. They expand services and opportunities to the homeless. They implement performance measurement systems to evaluate existing programs. They increase housing stability and permanent and transitional housing and maintain and provide official counts, data, and information on the homeless for those um, three regions. Mergers are the fourth level in partnership work where the investment of time and resources is very high 
and the integration that is required of the various stakeholders and parties involved is also very high. This type of partnership work typically happens when organizations realize they're more effective when they unite to become one entity or one organization takes on a service provided by another organization. <coughs> Excuse me, we're actually gonna look at two merger examples. This first one was actually one that was brought on first by financial hardship. So the Boys and Girls Club of Baraboo in Sauk County closed its doors in November 1st of 2007 so the board could focus on raising money to reopen. There were leadership challenges on staff and the board. If they raised the funds, they were still faced with the challenge of hiring a new executive director. So the Boys and Girls Club of Tomba was approached by the regional service director from Boys and Girls Clubs of America to talk about a management agreement. <coughs> Excuse me. Baraboo and Toma are similar in size and they're located within a one hour drive. The Tomba executive director would manage the Baraboo Club while both boards investigated the pros and cons of merging into one strong organization. The management agreement was originally a six month agreement that, <coughs> excuse me, that automatically renewed and was canceled by either party. And it actually lasted 18 months. Well, at first this seemed to be a really long agreement. The executive director was able to gain trust of all board members on each board and to work with the staff to prepare them for a merger. It was not without frustration, however, this long-term engagement period allowed the two boards to get comfortable with each other and also helped the new organization's board development committee to set priorities and a base for the new corporate culture that was building on the strengths of both individual organizations. And this collaboration is a model of a short-term management agreement. So the next example we're gonna look at is uh, another merger example that uh, is from the Arizona Children's Association. And it provides a good example of a nonprofit that has pursued um, strategically merger and acquisition and realized a real substantive value from doing so. So the first one was on financial hardship. The second one is a real strategic process um, to grow the services that they provide. So 15 years ago, this um, Arizona Children's Association was a $4.5 million organization sounds like a lot probably for a lot of you guys, focused primarily on offering residential services in Tucson. As they looked to the future, the leaders realized that they would need to modify their mission to have the kind of impact that they wanted. The president and CEO said directly that we are primarily a residential treatment organization and they didn't have any services in primary prevention and early childhood work. So from a mission perspective of protecting kids and preserving families, they needed to be serving kids earlier to give families the tools and reach the kids before they arrived at their residential services. So because they didn't have the staff expertise or the donor relationships or the brand to build this new effort to serve families, 10 years ago they acquired an organization that did. So this marked the beginning of kind of their rapid strategic expansion through merger and acquisition. So six acquisitions later, this organization has grown from a 4.5 million organization to a 40 million statewide nonprofit with a broad continuum of care for children and their families. And this growth didn't just come from the purchase of other organizations, each one strategically allowed this entity to add new services and skills and to spread them to every office and program across the organization. So once the organization achieved its critical mass in a given area, engaged in competitive bidding to further their organic growth. Collective impact is the final level in partnership work that we're gonna discuss, and it's one that's relatively new, but it's getting a lot of attention these days. Collective impact believes that large scale social change comes from better cross sector coordination rather than from isolated interventions of individual organizations. It's an innovative and structured approach to making collaboration work across varied sectors, including government, business, philanthropy, nonprofit organizations, and citizens to achieve significant and lasting social change. This model particularly typically happens when there's someone championing the work who has some level of influence in the community. 
Additionally, there typically has to be some adequate financial resources and some great sense of urgency for change. Let's take a look at an example of a collective impact that's happening in Massachusetts called Shape Up Somerville. So Shape Up Somerville is a citywide effort to reduce and prevent childhood obesity in elementary school children in Somerville, Massachusetts. It was initially led by two professors, professors sorry, at Tufts University and funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, and United Way of Massachusetts Bay in Merrimack Valley. So you can see there was, a, there was a good substantive amount of funding to help support this. The program engaged government officials, educators, businesses, nonprofits, and citizens in collectively defining wellness and weight gain prevention practices. As a result, the schools agreed to offer healthier foods, teach nutrition, and promote physical activity. Local restaurants received a certification that they serve low-fat, high-nutritional food. The city organized a farmer's market and provided healthy lifestyle incentives, such as reduced-priced gym memberships for city employees. And even sidewalks were modified, and crosswalks were repainted to encourage more children to walk to school. The result was a statistically significant decrease in body mass index along the community's young children between 2002 and 2005. And I know Bethany is going to uh, put a link in the chat box if you're interested in learning more. So we just went through the very partnership levels and illustrated for you the differences in what was involved in terms of investment and integration of the stakeholders. And again, there's no right or wrong on these different levels, all appropriate at different times. We're actually now going to hear from one of our great VISTAs who will show us an additional example of community work that is happening through the collective impact model, the last one we just discussed around partnerships. Yeah, and now I'd like to introduce to you Alex Bew. Alex is a Promise Zone Economic Development and Public Safety Coordinator with the City of Philadelphia's Mayor's Office of Community Empowerment and Opportunity. Alex is helping to jumpstart the West Philadelphia Renaissance with renovated storefronts, refurbished upper floors, and safer streets. <clears throat> Alex is originally from Oakland, California. He graduated from Vassar College, worked in Jakarta as a journalist, and then he moved to Philadelphia to serve with AmeriCorps VISTA in the Philadelphia Promise Zone. Alex? Hi, this is Alex. Can you hear me? Oh, we can. Go ahead, Alex. All right, cool. So I'm Alex. I actually am originally from Portland, Oregon. I see a lot of Pacific Northwest uh, vistas in the chat box. That's cool. Grew up in Oakland, and now I'm working in the Promise Zone. So the Promise Zone is a place-based anti-poverty initiative created by President Obama in 2014. Originally, there were five Promise Zones across the country. Now there are 13. The Prom Zone Initiative was created on the principle that a child's zip code should not determine destiny. The Philadelphia Prom Zone is about two square miles in West Philly, a high crime area of entrenched poverty. So to give you an idea, there's about a 50% poverty rate in the Prom Zone among the 35,000 residents. So, my office partners with local leaders to create opportunity for the residents. The crux of the Promise Zone is collaboration. Uh, in total, we have you know, 20, 25 different partners serving on six different committees that adjourn monthly. And these partners include community development corporations, or CDCs, community development financial institutions, CDFIs, NACs, or Neighborhood Advisory Committees, and city agencies and anchor institutions. So anchor institutions are hospitals, universities, they're the huge employers that don't move. My office convenes these partners around a shared agenda. So the Promise Zone doesn't have lending or investment capital, and early on my boss told me that convening is a powerful tool in itself. This is all we can do, and I figured it wasn't very much. Uh, over time, I've learned convening is actually quite powerful in this context. So let me give you an example of what I'm doing. 
Next slide, Andy. Yep. So there's this program called the Storefront Improvement Program. And this is the program that convinced me the power of partnership. So SIP is a program put in place by the Philadelphia Department of Commerce. Uh, property and business owners on commercial corridors are eligible for application. So commercial corridors are those busy streets of restaurants, apartments, and retailers that you would recognize in every neighborhood. And there are two big commercial corridors inside the Promise Zone. Okay, so back to SIP. SIP reimburses successful applicants for the program up to 50% of the cost of their storefront renovations. So the cap is at $5,000, and if a business spends $10,000 towards improving its storefront, they receive half that money back as a result of the storefront improvement program. So beautified facades are really important. This isn't just an aesthetic change. Uh, beautified facades increase foot traffic, they increase commerce, and as a result, they make neighborhoods safer. And, you know, the, the Palma Zone is historically a dangerous area. For example, this quarter alone, we've seen 20 shootings. Last year, at the same time, we saw just three shootings. So beautified facades, they bring people to the neighborhood, they make the neighborhood safer. These are in line with the priorities of the Promise Zone. But the problem with the Storefront Improvement Program is that these business owners, these applicants, they still need $10,000 up front because they only reimburse the money after spending it. So this kind of capital is quite a lot for businesses in the Promise Zone whose margins are already quite small. So. Here's how the Palm Zone helped. We created a partnership between CDFIs, again, those are community development financial institutions, and the Commerce Department. So CDFIs are nonprofit lenders. They're kind of an antidote to banks, where banks base their loans upon criteria like financial solvency and therefore disbar the communities that most need their loans. Uh, CDFIs have lower criteria, their capital is open to a broader range of communities. All right, so the Promise Zone, we convened CDFIs, these nonprofit banks, throughout the city. We created a shared agenda that targeted corridors in the Promise Zone. So, for example, one CDFI expressed interest in helping businesses access the storefront improvement program. I'm sorry, this is a, these are a lot of acronyms, um, but again, the SIP is that program that reimburses small business owners on corridors up to $5,000. So, with the CDFI, we created a zero interest lending program to cover the upfront cost. There are other CDFIs, other lenders with other interests, and we're putting together a loan program for interior renovation. Soon we'll have put together another city CDFI collaboration in which lenders put capital towards an upper floor renovation program similar to SIP. So between all these partnerships with SIP, we have more than $300,000 committed towards storefront improvement. It was collaboration between multiple partners that created the momentum to implement a large scale program. This is the result of a patient gradual partnership. Next slide. So, takeaways. Um, hindsight is 2020. So I've told you about the final corridor project, but the process was something else. The process was difficult. Partnerships are difficult. They're slow. Yet the Promise Zone must work collaboratively. Not only is partnership built into its collective impact model, but collaboration opens doors that we as government agents wouldn't otherwise have access to. These are, I mean, at a civic meeting the other week, someone asked me, you know, what has the government done for us the past 40 years? And so they're skeptical that suddenly this promise zone wants to help them. Uh, 
no single organization can do it all. This goes for city agencies and nonprofits. Of course, the temptation is to overextend yourself. You're excited about VISTA, the networking, the potential. And so it is with nonprofits, who also overextend themselves. But do yourself a favor. Under promise, over deliver. Promising too much and delivering too little can hamstring a partnership off the starting line. Part of delivering is knowing your capacity. To this end, start small. The corridor project I talked about started too big. We were dealing with too many players without a sense of the program demand. It was only when partners and myself doubled down on one effort in particular that we created the model for implementing others. And all of this takes patience. Progress is slower when inhibited by monthly meetings. But while the compromise is initially greater, over time, the opportunity cost pays for itself. The goal of social enterprise should be quality, not expediency. And by working with partners, you work towards a durable, meaningful result. And thank you, Alex, for sharing your experiences with partnership development work with the Philadelphia Promise Zone. Alex is going to stick around for the rest of the session, so if you have questions specifically for Alex, feel free to submit them in the question and answer, and we'll make sure that they get responded to. As Alex said, partnerships are many times slow-moving and complex and require a lot of patience, which is why the pre-partnership phase or planning phase is so very important. No matter where you are and the type of partnership you are considering or are engaged in, it's important to consider conditions that signify either readiness or lack of readiness, both within your organization and outside of your organization. Partnerships and collaboration can often be talked about in terms of a journey or a trip, and sometimes you have a real clear destination and other times you do not. Regardless, you take paths that get you places. So similar to trips or journeys, Collaborations move through loose phases that have varied tasks which can be accomplished or milestones that can be achieved. There are many descriptions out there about the phases of partnership work, but this is one we're going to specifically present, which comes from the University of Wisconsin Cooperative Extension. What it says basically is there are three phases of partnership and collaboration building for which there are not distinct requirements per se, but just suggestions on tasks to consider. Phase one is about getting started. Someone or some entity has an idea and wants to share it with others. There's a vision that is shared and refined, interests of varied parties that are explored, and stakeholders are identified, assessed, and engaged. Here, relationships are built and decisions are made about whether or not each individual stakeholder can and is willing to be a part of the partnership. For the purpose of this webinar, this is where we're going to spend our time, but let's talk a little bit briefly about the other two phases. Phase two is a particular phase about the path to success, so the route the partnership group will take to get where they want to go. It involves a great deal of attention to the process side of things, focusing on you know, written agreements between the varied parties, processes and systems to ensure the partnership group moves smoothly and accomplishes its goal, and indicators of success are developed so the group can track its impact along the way. And finally, phase three is about getting to the final destination. It's at this point that the partnership group is focused on both celebration and sustainability, showcasing the impact and accomplishments, and exploring ways to ensure that the work is sustained over time and getting larger buy-in from the community so the work can continue. So as stated before, we're going to spend most of our time today talking about phase one of partnership work, the getting started phase, for which there are many activities going on in this phase, um, but there are some really common areas of focus. And here are the beginning steps to starting partnership work, and let's talk briefly about each. So first and most important, any entity or organization that's wishing to work with others to address a community need or issue must first assess oneself and the organization's, particularly the organization's capacity to get engage in partnership. 
So it involves asking questions such as, what do we want to accomplish? What resources do we have already? And what more do we need? What types of organizations or individuals might make good partners? What could they bring? What would be in it for them? What level of partnership would make sense given our goal, resources, and potential partner? What history do we have in the community and in working with others? And, and much, much more. There are many tools out there that can help organizations ask these similar questions we just looked at and talked about. But the specific areas are ones that are but these particular specific areas that are important to consider. Helping organizations determine if they're ready to partner. And each of these areas, again, has varied questions you as an organization could, could, should consider as you begin thinking about partnering with, with others. So here's some examples of other questions that are important to ask. You want a community support? Do we have a previous history of working within the community? Is it a positive one? Do you have credibility within the community? And Alex talked a little bit about that and, and what he was discussing. Leadership support. Does our executive director board and other leadership support partnership work? Are they open to sharing the stage with others? Also questions around purpose. You know, why do we want to form this community partnership? Questions around organizational culture. Does our mission, culture, and priorities encourage, support, and recognize the value of partnerships? And finally, questions around resources, both your, you know, what assets you can provide and what things that you need. So what's the time commitment involved? Do you have the time needed to engage and form partnerships, resources, those kinds of things? Again, it's not simply not feasible to just say you want to partner with someone else and just do it. You really have to take some time to assess your organization's history and readiness to do this really important work. So I want to talk to you about a particular tool. Thank you. Um, this one is one that you all can actually use or an organization can use to conduct on themselves to determine the, your self-readiness for partnership work, and it actually is available to you um, and we'll reference it and where it is located at the end of this webinar. Now, while serving as a VISTA, you may or may not have the authority to do an internal assessment of your organization's readiness to partner, but what you can do is ask some of these questions in a more informal way, either to your supervisor or other points of contact so you can learn more about your organization. And as you engage in partnership work in the future, this tool can be very helpful. A few things to remember, though, about this tool and others that are out there like this. There's not like a number out there that if you answer so many questions correct, you're ready to partner. These questions really solely serve as a guide to help organizations better understand their own capacities and readiness. Ultimately, these questions can help your organization become more aware of your, your current strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. The second step in beginning partnership work after you've kind of assessed your own organization's internal readiness is determining who your organization should partner with, whether it's people, varied organizations, or varied entities. And just like there were varied areas of your organization readiness, there are also varied areas for which you need to assess potential fit with others. So first you have to assess who might be a potential partner in the work you want to do. These potential partners can include, as you can see on the wheel to the right, schools, social service agencies, youth serving agencies, colleges and universities, local businesses and corporations, organizations for special groups such as um, AARP or arts and cultural organizations. They can include recipients of service and many other entities. You may need to do some research to help you identify what individuals and organizations might be interested in your project, even where, you know, what organizations and individuals might be in your community if you're new to that community as a VISTA. So try to learn as much as possible about the community, its strengths, its resources, its people, its history and culture, and who are the leaders. And learning more about this community before approaching shows that you're genuinely interested in the community and can really help you gain local credibility. I think Alex really referred to that as he talked about the skepticism that existed in the community about this promise zone work. And so a lot of that can be addressed through time and building relationships and trust. You also can gain a better sense of who might serve as possible community partners 
um, getting to know the community and how it works is, is an ongoing process, I think, like Alex referred to, that takes time and patient, patience. You look to vary community resources and sections to really understand the makeup and history of the community. So a couple of things I want to point out. You know, once you've identified who those individuals or organizations or entities are, it's really important to consider a few things. One, you know, just network, network, network. Network your way in the door. It's really important that you as a VISTA or as a, just a community participant Get to know those in the community. It may be in, include attending community meetings. It may be in participating in a range of advisory committees or associations. And recognize that you know building relationships and getting your foot in the door is a slow process and a social process. So it does take time and patience. The second piece is really arm yourself with information. Learn as much as you can about both the community and the individuals and entities within it. You know, find out what folks' histories are, what they do, what their strengths are, how they fit within the current community, and be prepared to, you know, absorb that information and share it as you're having conversations. The third thing is focus on your potential partner and what they need. A lot of times, we go to people with what we want, but instead really think about um, what you can offer and what you require. So if possible, really be prepared to be um, present options for the entity that you're approaching as far as benefits and opportunities and things that you need to make the partnership work, but also be prepared to be flexible um, as you're talking to folks, and, and be prepared to kind of customize things as you as you enter into discussions. The fourth thing is present your partnership through a strong and formal presentation, kind of similar to what we did in pre-service orientation with the minute message and making the ask. You have to create kind of your selling points, be able to talk eloquently about what is in it for others and what is in it for you, so you can be really clear about what the goals of the partnership could be and why would they want to be a part. Um, and finally, you know, the importance of being persistent and following up. You know, it's one thing to make a great presentation to folks about the potential for partnerships, but you have to take the responsibility for following up afterwards. And that could be by, you know, arranging a time to follow up with a meeting or another conversation after that original presentation. It could be writing up a formal you know, memo about what was discussed and what you agreed upon. It really is important to make sure that you recognize that it's a constant process that you have to stay on top of. We had a program director that constantly talks about this phase of the partnership work as kind of a constant PR campaign. So this second tool we're showing here is also one that will be available for you and is one that can help you with this assessing the potential partnership phase. Um, so this tool, as you can see, or hopefully you can see, looks at um, varied areas of assessment. So as you're looking at external partners, you want to find out their type of organization, what their mission and culture is, the issue areas that they focus on, the resources that they offer, and maybe the resources that they may need, the geography that they serve, um, get to know a little bit more about their policies and provisions, and also, uh, you know, there's an area on this tool to kind of make notes about your final decisions on the partnership once you've asked some of the previous questions. This tool will also be available to you, um, and we'll talk reference where it will specifically be at the end of the webinar. And finally, in step three of this initial phase one of partnership work, um, it's important to develop kind of a vision of success, just like we talked about at PSO, so that all players understand what you are trying to achieve together. If you remember, we all created a visual, a napkin sketch of success, and it's really important as you begin to develop partnership work that everyone's on the same page with what you're trying to achieve. <coughs> So as you begin this work together, you must have extensive dialogue with your partners about the desired future state. Where do you want to go? What is it that you want to see as a result of your efforts? What does success look like organizationally for your partnership and for the community? 
you also need to identify what people will be contributing to the partnership in terms of people, time, money, in-kind goods and resources, space, all of those things. <coughs> Excuse me. And finally, the, the, for most partnerships, formal systems, processes, and documents are important to create and put in place so everyone understands their role and commitment in the work in addition to how things will, will get done. And in this stage, you'll begin to develop those, but you'll work more on them in the second phase. Okay. So to wrap up our time in talking about partnerships and, and how to begin the work, we want to spend some final time talking about factors that can make or break partnerships. So I'd like you to consider this question on the screen and again, <coughs> excuse me, and again enter your responses in the chat box. So think about a time when you were on a team that was very successful. What did you have or do that made it work? All right, and the responses are starting to come in. First up, we heard from Taylor, constant and thorough communication, which of course is key to any kind of relationship. Um, oh, helping an indecisive group of people get to decision making, um, plotting out a common goal, um, follow through, having clear objectives and well-defined individual roles, um, tasks for everyone, uh, developing camaraderie and, and, and putting together that kind of social environment or um, a sense of belonging or um, organizational cohesiveness for the partnership. Um, being organized, staying on topic during meetings, <clears throat> getting ideas from other people. Um, again, a clear goal, outlining tasks, having a leader who took responsibility to organize the group. So lots and lots of great ideas about what makes uh, a team effective. Um, and a lot of that was around organization, communication, leadership, and follow through. So Amy, I'll go back to you. Thank you. So um, similar to the responses that Andy was just reading out loud and that you gave, there are many factors that can help partnerships to work more successfully. So we're going to talk briefly about some of those factors. The ones you see here now on the screen are ones that really are important to be in place for partnerships to be successful. Again, many of which mirror what you just shared to that previous question. So there are factors that are specifically related to the environment. Again, do you have a history of collaboration or, co or cooperation in the community? Is the collaborative group seen as a, leg a legitimate leader in the community? And is there um, a political and social climate that's favorable right now for this work? Second, there are factors related to membership characteristics. So one, do you have mutual respect, understanding, and trust within the group? You, you talked about that earlier. Are there appropriate cross-section of members? Have a diverse group of people been, you know, thought about in the forming of the group? And are members, do members see collaboration as important for the whole, or are they seeing it more in their self-interest? And you know, also, is there an ability to compromise, which you talked about in your responses? There's also factors related to process and structure, which we've talked about a little bit. You know, do members share a stake in both the process and the outcomes? Are there multiple layers of decision making with some flexibility that exists so that people feel like changes can be made? Are there clear roles and policy guidelines that are written down and agreed upon and signed? And that particularly plays a role in some of the, you know, the, the levels of partnership that we discussed towards the end of the continuum. And finally, is there adaptability, kind of flexibility and adaptability? There are also factors related to communication. Is there open and frequent communication? And are there both like established informal and formal communication links? There are also factors related to purpose. Like we said before, it's really important in phase one to set um, concrete attainable goals and objectives and to create that shared vision that has a unique purpose that everyone feels that they can play a part towards. And finally, we discussed this a few times, there are factors related to resources. It's really important that you have both sufficient funds and I'd say sufficient resources in terms of people and time, and also there needs to be a skills convener, someone that's trusted that can really facilitate the group moving along. 
And finally, I think like all of us know, kind of trust is at the foundation of it all. It's really important to be, a, be very clear about your interests and your partner's interests, because sometimes those interests are, are not the same. And really make the case for a partnership based on your prospective partner's interests, not just yours. Be really alert to potential turf issues, because they really do exist in communities. Um, and these could include conflicting work styles, different languages, and just separate priorities. Really important to agree on the goals of the partnership. You know, as Alex said, start smaller and build gradually. Be careful not to start with too much so that you can build successes along the way. It's also really important to identify who is responsible for what task, and that part of that goes into the, the written documents that can really outlining that and making sure that everyone is, plays a responsible part. It's also really important to be specific about financial arrangements and really take care of that discussion up front so that everyone understands what finances and in-kind resources they're committing to the work. It's also really important to discuss topics around liability and things like that to ensure that um, those issues are on the table at the very beginning, similar to the financial piece. And again, agree on the measures of success for the partnership and, and agree on it so that everyone has a part in making the decisions about that and can really buy into what that success is about. It's really, um, also you all know, it's very important that you carry out the end of your bargain and your partner carries out the end of the bargain. If either one of you are not playing, carrying out what you said you would do, that can impact the level of trust that exists in the partnership. And finally, and then of course, establish upfront how communication takes place. We talked about that just a second ago. Um, and also the importance, as we talked about in the previous slide, of that one liaison, that convener that is responsible for making sure the group moves forward. And then of course, we've talked about this several times, having that written agreement is really important, particularly as you go on to the, um, the varied levels of partnerships that require more formality. And then you might recognize these areas. This brings us back to the key skill areas we discussed during PSO or pre-service orientation that we talked about um, being crucial to capacity building and community empowerment. If you remember these symbols, they were relationship building, problem solving, and communication. So not only are these skill areas essential to your success, but they are also essential to partnership work. And at the root of these three skill areas is the factor of trust that we just discussed. So we'd like to wrap this up with just one final question from, um, again, for you all to answer. So what, what's one action you're considering from this webinar? I know many of you all are in the midst of partnership work, but a lot of you all were um, are just beginning a project or thinking about uh, using partnerships as a strategy to do your particular task. I noted that from the beginning. So what's one thing that you're considering after um, you've participated in this particular session? So it looks like a lot of you already have ideas for what you're going to do, which is great. Um, Alex says putting together notes to share with coworkers and bosses. It's a great way to share the learning so that you're not the only one who um, has this understanding. Um, uh, several of you have mentioned the internal assessment for readiness. So figure out where your organization is and whether this is the right time and if it's not, maybe what you need to do to get your organization ready. Um, looking at different uh, models of collaboration, looking at what others have done and see what has been successful. Um, ah, there's a, uh, an existing partnership that's not really in use, but it could be revitalized. So that would be a great uh, step for, um, for one of you. Uh, someone mentioned getting more information on the promise zones, um, maybe looking to those and, and others as examples for collaboration or collective impact. Um, uh, becoming a little bit more strategic in creating our partnerships so rather than just diving in, maybe doing some research or, or having a, a plan and a, a potential goal um, to help direct your work there. Uh, another idea, meeting with potential partners, um, uh, focusing on your communication to make sure that things are clear 
and that everybody understands what the, the goal and intention so they can line it up with their mission. Um, so lots of, lots of you have great ideas for what you can do as a result of this session um, to get started or to, to advance your partnership work. So Amy, um, maybe we can share now some resources. Yeah, definitely. So um, thank you, Andy. We've mentioned several resources throughout the webinar, so I do want to remind you of a few of those um, that can help you get started on the either the initial steps of partnering or help you take a step back and, and assess where you are on, the, on your partnership work. So several resources have been um, curated and put onto the VISTA campus specifically. And all these links will be added to the page with the webinar recordings, um, and they're going to be pasted into the chat box right now by Bethany. Um, the, so the, the tools we referenced, all of those will be um, on that page. Additionally, there are some really great manuals or guides, if you want to call them, on the topic of partnerships that are great resources. Overall, the ones that we've put on, on this particular slide are really easy to read, and they provide several case studies that can really illustrate some of the concepts that we've discussed. Particularly my favorites are the Making Community Partnerships Work Manual and the Frameworks for Working Together. Again, they're just really easy to read, and I, I love them because they're written by community folks with some really good ideas and illustrations to demonstrate some of the importance of these concepts. And then finally, um, so to kind of wrap up, so now that you've heard this information, just some things to think about. Where should you start if you, you're being specifically tasked to support partnership work? Or maybe you're considering, considering forming a partnership to support the particular task on your VISA assignment description. Just consider these important steps that you can take first. Spend time, I would suggest spend time reviewing some of the resources that are on the campus. There's a lot of great um, resources around partnership on the VISTA campus and also the ones that we're posting on the webinar recording page we think will be really helpful for you. Also, talk with your supervisor and your um, organization leadership about the history of partnerships and ideas for future focus. Um, third, I'd, I'd really start with the internal assessment. Really take a look internally about your organization's readiness to partner and maybe what areas you may need to to work on to be better prepared for this partnership work. And then fourth, consider potential partners, get to really know the community and ask assessment questions about the potential fit. Whatever you do, however, it's really important that you don't engage in partnership work without, of course, talking to your supervisor first. Both your supervisor and your organization have to really buy into the process and, and trust you as a player in this partnership work, which is very important work. So make sure that that's always at the forefront of your mind, which I know it always is. Excellent. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, we're going to get to your questions in just a minute, but uh, before we do that, I want to invite you to take a minute to respond to our evaluation poll. You see it there on the right side of your screen. It takes just a couple minutes to answer uh, these 10 questions. Um, tells what you thought about today's presentation and also ideas you have for other topics that we could offer in the future. And while you're working on that, we're going to turn um, to your questions, and so I'm going to invite our operator, Ted, to come back on the line and explain for those of you who have connected by phone how you can ask a question. Ted? The phone lines are now open for questions. If you'd like to ask a question over the phone, please press star 1 and record your name. If you'd like to withdraw your question, press star 2. Thank you. All right, and of course, we um, still have the Q&A feature, which is available on the right side of your screen. It's now just above the evaluation poll. So if um, you don't see it open, you can click on the triangle next to Q&A, and that will open up the Q&A panel so you can ask a question. Uh, so we've got a few questions in already. Um, and let's see. Uh, well, uh, looks like we've answered some of these already in um, during the presentation. Right, so we're going to turn back to Ted to see if we have any questions yet on the phone lines. 
I'm not showing any questions yet, but again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. All right, and of course, if you'd like to ask one through the WebEx, um, click on the triangle next to Q&A and um, put your question in the box and then be sure to submit. And while we're waiting for questions to come in, um, maybe, uh, Sam, we can go back to our resources slide and we can have those up so folks can take a look um, to see some of those things. Great, thank you. Um, there are a number of uh, a number of resources available, as Amy mentioned, on the Vista campus. Uh, we've already, um, we do have a recording of another webinar that we did um, a couple years ago, I think, takes a slightly different look at partnership work, um, but we've got uh, the other resources that are listed here um, that we really recommend that you take a look at. And then, in particular, the assessment tools um, that we've talked about, both the internal uh, assessment and the external assessment, um, those links are posted in the chat. You can scroll up and find those. or um, they'll be available on the VISTA campus when we post the recording of this, uh, this session. All right, so here are a couple questions that have come in now. Uh, Christian uh, asks, how do you usually approach potential partners for the very first time? So how would I get started? So Amy, would you like to take a, a stab at that? Sure, I mean, I think we talked about that a little bit um, in one of the previous slides. I mean, one, I think it's important to first arm yourself with information. As much as you can, research and learn more about the particular entity you're approaching. Um, both, you know, like basic information around like what their mission is, what their goals are, what geographic area they serve, who's their, you know, who staffs their organization, those kinds of things. So you're armed with information about who you're approaching and any way that you can start to build relationships with those entities, whether again, like we talked about, you know, going to community meetings, uh, being a part of different committees or associations, uh, maybe finding someone who may have or an already developed relationship with that entity so you can get a foot in the door that way. It's, it's almost so similar to when you're getting ready to do an interview for a job, you know, doing that initial um, ground research that can help, you know, you know more about the entity that you're approaching, but also finding people that can help get your foot in the door so that person sees you as someone that they can trust. I don't know if others have any thoughts, or if Alex, you have additional ideas. Uh, you're good. <laughs> All right, thanks, Amy. Um, and this next question um, talks uh, about federal funding, so maybe both Amy and Alex will have some thoughts about it. Yeah. So, so Corey asks, uh, can you speak a little bit about joint funding? and how partnerships can work together uh, to seek or, or to um, put to use federal funding. So Amy, do you want to start with that? And then Alex, maybe you can add to it. Sure, I mean, with federal funding in particular, most of the times it has to be one entity that's making the application for the funding, but um, the varied entity for which you're applying might have particular rules about um, partnerships and engagement, and it, it may be as simple as they require um, letters of, formal letters of agreement to be emailed as attachments, or they may require you to talk about it in a narrative form about the um, role that partners and community um, entities have played in the development of this proposal and idea. They run the gamut, but typically there has to be one entity that um, is willing to take the response serve as, as kind of what you would call the legal applicant. Right. So, 
typically there is a leading applicant who takes that responsibility. Um, but in my experience with the trauma zone, there is a swing towards collaborative applications. This is in part the purpose of the trauma zone, incentivizing joint federal grant applications. And so it's often the stipulation that, for example, a government agency like my own office or like the Mayor's Office of Art, for example, must apply in coordination, in conjunction with a local nonprofit. Um, so that said, there's, there's a lot of overhead involved. I mean, federal grants in particular are rigorous processes. Uh, in a way, they're primed for partnership because, for example, my office has greater reach with data, and that's exactly what these federal reviewers want to see, data. And so having a nonprofit partner with a government organization is a way of bringing down bigger funds and also exploring the resources of the government. Great. Thanks, Alex and Amy, for that one. Um, Next question is, uh, Thomas sounds like he's having a struggle engaging partners um, who need to submit documentation. He said he doesn't get responses back from them sometimes, and he's not sure how to proceed. Yeah, there, I, I think that there's so many, I think, factors that you have to assess um, to figure out why you're not getting the responses you're getting, and there could be so many things. Um, it could be about trust, like we discussed earlier. There might be a history of mistrust, so people aren't as um, willing to provide that information in a timely way. Um, it could be, too, that it, you know, there is a perception sometimes that, oh, this is yet another uh, initiative that someone's requiring me to do. And so really, a lot of that stuff takes time that they can see that you're investing in the long term and this is something that's important that they participate in because they're going to get a real, they're going to see the results both for themselves and the overall community. It could be too that they don't understand what the big picture of the work is about. So we talked about the importance of setting visions and goals and outcomes if they weren't a part of the process and they don't see how what you're asking them to turn in or require them to do will help to meet that, then you also could see challenges like that that you're seeing. And, you know, I also think that results are really important to be able to demonstrate. So I think if people can't see results over time, you know, for the work that they're investing in it, they're also less likely to participate as you would like. So I oftentimes think about assessing it along those terms. Yeah, and it, it seems too from from what uh, you shared earlier, Amy, that that a case like that where partners aren't responding in a way that um, they're expected to, it might be an opportunity for the partners to just circle back and review. Well, what are our agreements, and you know, and are these things that we can abide by? And if they're not realistic, um, maybe we need to do some some adjustments. So. Um, and, you know, there's also some really great tools and some of those manuals about assessing um, your partnership work once you're in it. So I suggest you look at some of those because they're really great also tools to ask questions like, you know, to assess how things are going and where you might need to make improvements. Great. Good recommendation. Um, do a quick check with Ted to see if we have any callers on the line with questions. I'm not showing any questions at this time. Okay, great. So we'll go back to our Q&A queue here. Um, Dana asks, what if my supervisor and I disagree on whether our organization is ready for partnerships? Um, I was brought on in my VISTA role solely to establish these partnerships. So I'm guessing maybe uh, the supervisor, well, it, we can't tell from this who, who thinks which way, but um, there's, there's that disagreement. So. Um, Amy, any thoughts on what Dana could do when she and her, or he and her supervisor don't agree on um, whether they're ready? Yeah, I mean, we talk about this so much in pre-service orientation about um, the relationship between VISTA and supervisor. I oftentimes refer to it as a dance. 
that's something you have to kind of navigate and, and work slowly through. And um, sometimes you have these great ideas that you want to implement and the supervisor may disagree with you or they may support you and say, go forth and do. And um, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, you're a guest in this year in that organization and as a, in that role as a guest, you you do have to really respect the the feedback and the input that your supervisor is giving, while at the same time trying to gently influence them in ways that you think might move the the work forward. Um, but in the end, you know you only can do your you know positive steps to influence your supervisor and and guide have those critical and important discussions. Um, and then also I, I always talk with any national service member about really recognizing that sometimes things don't always go how you'd like them to, but you can really learn from those opportunities also. And maybe, you know, you didn't get to do exactly what you had planned in your year, but you've really learned from that and you're going to do, you may do it a little differently in your next role, whatever that next role may be. Um, but, in you know, in the end too, if you're finding that um, it's a situation where um, you're not able to carry forth the activities in your VISTA assignment description, which you're going to have to report on, then, you know, you know you have you know, other people that you could talk to and maybe within the organization there's someone else that you could have a conversation around. But respect the hierarchy of communication for sure. Great. That sounds like a, a pretty delicate situation to find yourself in. So we, we wish you a lot of luck with that one. Um, Next up, uh, Veronica asked a question and uh, might be a little bit beyond um, the scope of what we've presented today, but she says or asks, do you have any tips for ending a partnership that is no longer benefiting either party? I'm thinking about that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we, we, we were so focused on all the, the partnership startup and the, the first phase that um, we really, um, you know, like I said, this is a little bit beyond what we had planned to talk about today. Yeah, I mean, I think some of the concepts we talked about in the beginning phases are also very equally important in the ending phases. Um, I, I do want to also reference those manuals because those manuals also reference the, the varied phases and some things to consider. But I think making sure that your communication is very clear that you're really, you know, you're paying attention to relationship and trust um, because people um, probably care very deeply about the issue or the community or the work that they've engaged in over how, however long the time frame has been. So closing something out like that can be very personal for folks. So making sure that um, if you're doing so that you're respecting communication a lot and that you're able to really show people the success that they've achieved over time and why maybe the partnership is no longer needed because this is now happening as a result of all the great work that you did. Great, great, good response. Um, we've got a little more than five minutes left and a few more questions to go, so we'll do our best to, um, to try to get to everyone. Uh, Lowell asks, are there examples of grant submissions available for partners who may want to apply for federal grants? So, Amy, do you have any thoughts about that? Um, you know, most federal agencies are required at a, you know, at a minimum to include some basic information um, from applicants, and typically the, the, um, what they provide are, are summaries of those applications, so you don't get the in, entire application itself. So if you wanted a specific sample, you would probably have to go directly to the entity that, that made the application, and maybe it's one that, you know, is in another community that uh, you really, uh, your, your community may be closely aligns with, and they'd be willing to share their information with you. And I know, you know, a lot, particularly probably around the Promise Zone work, um, there's probably a lot of sharing of information and willingness to support other communities that are now being identified within that particular designation. Yeah, Alex, I'm curious if you have any perspectives, um, having worked in the Promise Zone and working with so many federal 
with partners um, about uh, grant opportunities with uh, federal agencies? Yeah, um, my experience applying for federal grants is that, again, they're quite rigorous. Uh, to get an idea of you might go on the grants.gov website and look within the categories to see which your partners are eligible for. Um, but depending upon the extensiveness and the capacity, the extensiveness of the grant application, and the capacity of your partner, I would recommend looking perhaps locally to foundations and also if they're looking for technical assistance, smaller nonprofits, again like CDFIs, community development financial institutions, would be able to make those smaller loans and grants. Um, it comes down to what your partner is prepared for. But if you're interested, yeah, I would recommend looking at grants.gov and then investigating the big foundations in your state. Great. <clears throat> Thanks for those suggestions, Alex. Um, all right, one last time. Ted, do we have anybody on the phones? I'm not showing any questions at this time. Okay, and it looks like uh, it looks like we've covered all the questions that have come in through the Q and A. Um, but Sam, if I've missed any, um, feel free to call them out. And it looks like not. So um, I want to thank all of you for participating today. The the chat um, participation, your responses there has been great and enriching, um, and hopefully you found something helpful there. I also want to invite you and, and give you a little bit of information about our next webinar for VISTA members. It's Avoiding Burnout During Service, coming up on November 12th, same time. Um, you'll be getting an email with more details about that, so we encourage you to sign up if that one is of interest. And I also want to take this time to thank both of our presenters today, Amos Salinas, um, one of our PSO facilitators um, and a great trainer, and then Alex Bew, the VISTA member serving with the Philadelphia Promise Zone, um, for all of the information that they have researched and put together um, and the great presentation they've done today. So thank you all for participating, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.